good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. This really, really is truly a special day. Uh, I think this is the first Hampton Heroes we've done maybe in the last, was it four years, five years? Since COVID. Yeah, since COVID. And so um, one of the things we had said we wanted to do um, was initially we were trying our best to catch up on some of the folks we wanted to recognize. So we had this event for several years in a row. And now we just want to spread it out a little bit, take more time to honor individuals. So thank you all for coming. And um, thank you for being here on this really special day, Martin Luther King Day, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and our Hampton Heroes. So on behalf of our city council and our city, I'd like to say that we're so happy to be here together in person. I think the last time was again pre-COVID. With that, I want to introduce uh, certainly our elected officials who will be participating in today's program as well as some individuals who hold other elected offices either in our city or in our region. So I will ask, first of all, our Vice Mayor, Jimmy Gray. And, well, I'll tell you what, let's do this. Um, with the um, Virginia Peninsula Community, I'm sorry, Chamber of Commerce, they have what's called the one clap rule. And so what we're gonna do is just, I know there's a temptation to wanna clap for everybody. We're just gonna do one clap, all right, and then we're gonna move it along. All right, is that okay? We got that one? All right, Vice Mayor Jimmy Gray. Councilman Steve Brown. Councilman Chris Bowman. Councilwoman Hope Harper. Councilwoman Martha Mugler. Now I'm gonna turn around because one of our council members said he would try and be here. He's not here, but yeah. <laughs> Councilman Billy Hobbs. Now, our city treasurer, Chris Sneed. Our school board vice chair, Dr. Tina banks Gray. Now, I'm going to look some more, and I'm not going to see anybody. I'm going to blame it on Dr. Gray because she was supposed to be getting all the names for me. All right, so with that, we're going to move on. And now, we like to ask you all to stand for our national anthem, which will be sung by Rosa Riddick. Now, she, she supervises the people who write me my check. We have our city manager, Mary Bunton. Now, with that, I'm not sure I got everybody. Um, our communication strategist, Robin McCormick, and she's giving hugs in the back. We have our clerk, 
of counsel, Catherine Glass. That works, thank you, remember. Um, and I might mess up, but we have from our marketing department, Desia Scott. And around here with a camera somewhere is Brian Marchese, who's also in our marketing department. All right, I think with that, we are probably good. And so now, I would like to invite Reverend Dr. Simeon Green to provide the invocation. If you do not mind, would you please stand with us? Father, we pause now to recognize you and to thank you for your love and your kindness. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for this gathering this morning. Your presence is here with us. We're thankful for each family member that has a representative here that will be recognized during this program. Thank you again for Aberdeen. Some would say, where will we be today if it wasn't for Aberdeen? Thank you for the history. Thank you for those who labor. And thank you for those who have gone on to be with you. Everyone that has participated in the years that we've been together, we said thank you. Bless your people now, even in this gathering, when it's all said and done, may we be able to say together, it was wonderful to be there in Hampton, Virginia today. Bless us now. Thank you for our mayor. Continue to strengthen him as well. All the leaders, we say, in Jesus' name we pray and everyone say amen. I'm really having a good time. This isn't my notes, but Reverend Green and his wife used to be, um, I guess, the, the leaders at Jones Road, and he would come down from Richmond um, for the various, well, for the Sunday services and other services during the week, and even when they had the, um, they did a, 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 a food, um, Give a food bank. So he came down from Richmond. Now, he's no longer at Jones Road, he's in Richmond. But he still comes down. And that shows his attachment to the Aberdeen community. So I want to acknowledge him for that. More than one clap. <laughs> Super. Our chief of police uh, arrived late, but it's Chief Jimmy Weidman. Right, that works. And then again, this also is not my notes. But at last Saturday at the um, Alpha Breakfast, uh, I met the parents of Benita Billingsley. And I told them about this event. And Mrs. Billingsley, well, it's not Mrs. Billingsley, but she has a relationship with um, the people who actually were the architects and builders of Aberdeen. And so I want to thank them for making a sacrifice of coming over this afternoon to be a part of today's ceremony. <laughs> now I'm looking around and I see two people from city staff for our director of our history museum, Lucy Cochran. And then the director of our convention and business bureau, Mary Fugere. And if any of you had the uh, I guess, had, had tried to contact me. Um, there's a person who 
you generally speak to probably even more than you speak to me, and that's my assistant, Joy Mouts. All right. Now, I think I've taken care of everything that uh, was both written and not written. Uh, we actually have our assistant city manager coming in, Brian DeProfio. He's a gentleman standing and waiting. All right. Now, with that, I think we're good. All right. So, this gathering actually has a dual purpose. We're here this afternoon to honor the life of Dr. King and also to honor a few of those who have lived by some of the examples he set. Hampton Heroes Plaza honors a dedicated group of men and women who spent much of their lives doing for others, tearing down walls, building bridges, and working for social justice and equal rights. This year's honorees all have in common a great love for their neighborhood. The thing is, neighborhoods are more than a grouping of homes. They are, or can be, places where children are nurtured and residents help care for one another. Today, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, is a time to reflect on Dr. King's place in history and on the importance of doing for others in the way that he did. Martin Luther King Jr. was born on January 15, 1929, and he grew up to become a minister like his father. He became a civil rights activist and a world-renowned speaker and writer. He led nationwide protests and won a Nobel Peace Prize in 1964 for his battle against racial inequality and his support of nonviolent resistance. Although he was killed in 1968, Dr. King still serves as an example for us. He connects the men and women who fought decades ago for freedom and education to all of us here today and to those yet to come. Dr. King led a march, of, a movement of millions, people who joined him on marches, in churches, and in their hearts. Today we're here to recognize that movement and some of the most influential leaders of change here in Hampton. And as we read the names of these Hampton heroes, remember that they were not alone. Countless others work with them, building bridges that bring us together, not walls that keep us apart. This year we're adding a name to the category of modern, modern era trailblazers in public service. Dr. King once said, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. That describes Willie James Moffat. Will Moffat was a bridge builder, a statesman, a connector, a leader, and also a son, husband, father, grandfather, and friend. He was born in Meridian, Mississippi on May 7, 1954. He was raised in Detroit, in Detroit, and it was here that he met and married the absolute love of his life, Teresa. He eventually made his way to the great city of Hampton in 1977, where he was stationed at Langley Air Force Base, and together they raised three children, Teton, Telon, and Tamara. After leaving the Air Force and becoming a permanent resident of Hampton, Will spent another 31 years as a civilian with the Army before retiring in 2011 as the Director of Plans, Modernization, Mobilization, Training, and Personnel Security. As a volunteer, Will served on several citizen committees and held leadership positions, including Chair of the Hampton Neighborhood Commission, Vice Chair of the Hampton Redevelopment and Housing Authority, Co-Chair of the Hampton 400th Anniversary Committee, and President of the Volunteer Center of the Virginia Peninsula. He was a member of Hampton Citizens Unity Commission and the National Points of Light Foundation's neighboring task force. He also represented, represented the city of Hampton as citizen presenter at the International City and County Managers Association and served on the board of directors for numerous nonprofit organizations. He became a neighborhood leader and then a leader for the entire city. In 2010, Will was elected to Hampton City Council where he served two terms Will's passion for the community continuously energized him. It was his dream to have a haven for the youth in the neighborhood. This was a motivating force that led him to become one of the most influential voices pushing the city to turn a former school into a neighborhood asset. Y.H. Thomas Junior High School had been built to educate young black students. The building later became an integrated elementary school. It bounced around for a few other city and school uses until a coalition, including Will Moffat, urged the city to make part of the building into a neighborhood center 
so it once again could serve the surrounding community, especially its young people. YH Thomas Neighborhood Center was a new type of center, a city facility that also had a community board of directors who helped run and create activities. His endeavor to engage young people and reduce youth violence in the neighborhood broadened as Will moved from a neighborhood leader into a city leader. He worked with Cities United on strategies that brought the community together to help solve the problem. Once again, a great connector and bridge builder. Not only was Will's voice heard locally, but it was also heard nationally as well. He was instrumental in Hampton winning two National All-American City Awards, one in 2002 for Healthy Families and Neighborhoods, and the other in 2014 for our Choose Hampton campaign, where Will's baritone voice could be heard far and wide in support of his team. Will Moffat was a force to be reckoned with in Hampton. He stood for community, racial harmony, justice, and accountability. A noble, faithful man with a heart of pure gold, he embodied everything Hampton Heroes was established for, and I'm honored to commemorate him today. And sadly, Will passed away in 2022. I'd like to ask his wife, Teresa, and his children and grandchildren to please stand. And now, I would like to call on Vice Mayor Jimmy Gray to tell the story of our new category of honorees. Thank you, Mayor Tuck. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'd like to start with another quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. The hope of a secure and livable world lies with disciplined nonconformists who are dedicated to justice, peace, and brotherhood. The trailblazers blazers in human, academic, scientific, and religious freedoms have always been nonconformists. In any cause that concerns progress of mankind, put your faith in the nonconformists. It may be hard to believe now, but Aberdeen Gardens and its initial inhabitants were models for the entire nation, the very first neighborhoods built by blacks for blacks. Aberdeen Gardens was built between 1934 and 1937 as a resettlement community of African-American families in Hampton and Newport News. It was proposed and sponsored by Hampton Institute and funded by the New Deal, New Deal era resettlement administration. The subdivision was intended to serve as a model for other housing communities and developments with the goal of improving the health and social lives of families in substandard living. At the time, other such projects had already faced opposition campaigns from white residents and officials, resulting in either the demise of the projects or their conversion to whites-only housing. And while the defense of the supporters of Hampton Institute, the Resettlement Administration, and the local community, however, Aberdeen Gardens became the first development of, it kind, of its kind by blacks for blacks, a model that held true through its implementation. Aberdeen Gardens featured 158 colonial-style revival homesteads, a school, and a commercial center plotted on 440 acres of land. Each home was built with space for a garden, and an area was surrounded by a green belt that preserved the existence, existing flora and allowed for substance farming. All seven neighborhood streets were named for prominent African Americans, including the great educator Mary Peake, Richmond banker Maggie Walker, and John Mercer Langston, Virginia's first black congressman and the first dean of Howard University School of Law. Its placement along Aberdeen Road connected the neighborhood to the Newport News shipyard where many of its intended residents worked. And as the community took shape, however, its members began to represent a wide variety of professions. The resettlement project concluded in the 1940s as Aberdeen Gardens residents transitioned from renting to owning their homes and neighborhood and continue to grow and thrive. The unique history of Aberdeen Gardens has always been taught and preserved by its community through the Aberdeen Gardens Historic and Civic Association and the Historical Foundation of Aberdeen Gardens. In 1994, the Aberdeen Gardens was listed as a historic district of Virginia Landmarks Register and the National Register of Historic Places. 
In 2002, one of the original 158 homes was restored and opened as Aberdeen Gardens Historic Museum to share and celebrate the history, heritage, and future of the historic Aberdeen Gardens. These are the facts about Aberdeen Gardens, but when the residents and the descendants talk about Aberdeen, they often talk about more about the spirit of their neighborhood. The gardens was much larger than most neighborhood gardens today. The residents grew much of their own food, but not all grew the same vegetables. They, everyone grew something different so that there was bartering and trading. Most families had chicken coops, and there was a commercial area store and an owner that also bartered at times and extended credit to people in need. The property lines were crossed routinely with children playing across each other's yards, and that also meant that many had, they had many watchful eyes on the children. The kids couldn't get away with very much. Aberdeen School was across the street, and the Neighborhood Association today remains connected to that school. Aberdeen Gardens families knew that they were very special and that they were in the public eye, especially when there were calls to turn homes over to white people. They all had a special pride in their neighborhood. Their school and their rattler sports teams, the, the name comes from actually seeing snakes in the area. The families who settled there often remained in the area or returned after military service or jobs elsewhere. And there are names that are common in Hampton still today, including prominent doctors, lawyers, judges, engineers, council members, and business owners. Some have national prominence. The former residents included the Secretary of Energy, Hazel O'Leary, several professional football players, the Ambassador of South Africa, Madagascar and Tobago, and the 2012 Olympic gold medalist, Francina McCrory, and the former NBA star, Allen Iverson. The Tucker Family Cemetery, located behind the development, is believed to hold the remains of William Tucker, the first child of African parents to be baptized in English North America. Now, first honoree helped to get this audacious project started, Arthur Howe. Arthur Howe was born in South Orange, New Jersey in 1990. He attended Yale University, playing for the school's football team and later coaching it. And after leaving Yale, Howe attended Union Theological Seminary in New York and became a Presbyterian minister in 1916. He went on to serve as a professor, coach, and chaplain at the Loomis Institute, Trinity College, the Taft School, and Dartmouth College. In November 1930, Howe became the president of Hampton Institute, where he served until 1940. In 1934, Howe submitted the proposal for Aberdeen Gardens to the Federal Resettlement Administration, and throughout the project's duration, he was an avid champion, enlisting the support of Franklin D. Roosevelt, and defending the project from local opponents. When the local newspaper noted the quality of the neighborhood and calling the homes to be turned over to white workers, Howe reportedly reached out to Eleanor Roosevelt, who visited the neighborhood in 1938 and advocated for its black residents. We are able to, unable to locate a descendant of Mr. Howe, but if there are any or any representatives of the university, please stand. Thank you, and I would like to now call on Councilman Chris Bowman. Thank you, Vice Mayor Gray. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today. I would like to tell you a little bit about Hilliard R. Robinson. Hilliard Robinson was born in Washington, D.C. And, and was one of the best known black architects of his day. He attended the Philadelphia Museum and School of Industrial Arts, as well as the University of Pennsylvania, and received both Bachelor and Master of Architecture degrees from Columbia University in 1924 and 1931. Robinson did postgraduate studies in city planning at the University of Berlin in 1931 and 1932, where he was influenced by the Bauhaus style. Robinson served as head of the Department of Architecture at Howard University from 1926 to 1933, and he was responsible for conducting a slum housing survey in the District of Columbia in 1933. His involvement with Aberdeen Gardens began with his appointment as senior architect for the Resettlement Administration in 1934. 
He directed the design of the project as its principal architect. The colonial revival architecture of Aberdeen Gardens, set within an innovative open garden plan, highlights Robinson's ability as a planner and an architect. After his work on Aberdeen Gardens, Robinson designed several modernist style buildings at Hampton University during the 1950s, as well as numerous residencies in the Washington, D.C. area. I relinquish control to Councilman Steve Brown, who will introduce our next honorees. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I want to introduce uh, William R. Walker, Jr. William was born June 7, 1911, in Newport News. In 1993, 1932, Walker graduated magna cum laude from Howard University with a degree in civil engineering and a minor in business management. He returned to Newport News and taught at Huntington High School, his alma mater. Walker was appointed the community manager of Aberdeen Gardens in 1936. He was the only African American to hold a head supervisory role on such a project in the United States. He used his skills in business and engineering to successfully manage the program until it ended, helping Aberdeen residents transition from renting to purchasing property in their neighborhood. After his role at Aberdeen Gardens, Walker continued his work helping black families obtain affordable housing through his insurance and real estate business. He was a lifelong political advocate and community organizer, serving several terms as president of the Newport News chapter of the NAACP. Mr. Walker's son, Howard, lives in Maryland and was not unable and was able to attend. If there are any members of his family, will you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. The next honoree is someone I knew. I didn't know Mr. Walker, but I knew Roosevelt Wilson very well. Roosevelt Wilson, of course, was a community organizer. And whenever there was a major campaign in the city, he said, now, we've got to organize. We've got to get ourselves together. If you knew Mr. Wilson. <laughs> Roosevelt Wilson was born in Vicksburg, Mississippi on July 23, 1930. After attending high school in Columbia, Mississippi, Wilson enlisted in the United States Army and later entered the infantry as an officer in the candidate school at Fort Benning, Georgia. During, during his military career, Wilson commanded the U.S. Army recruiting station, the rifle company of 101st Airborne Division, and the 173rd Airborne Brigade. He retired from the Army in 1971 as a lieutenant colonel. While he was stationed at Fort Monroe, he studied sociology at Hampton Institute and became involved in the Aberdeen Gardens community. He served as president of the Aberdeen Gardens Historic and Civic Association, president and board member of the Historical Foundation of Aberdeen Gardens, and of the Girls Incorporated of Greater Peninsula. He was also an active member of many civic and community organizations, including the Office of Human Affairs, the Citizens Boys Club, and the PTA of Aberdeen, Sinclair, and Cesar or Cesar Tarrant Elementary Schools. Mr. Wilson has two daughters and one son, Cheryl Hollis and Denise Thomas, and a son, Ronald Wilson. I welcome them to stand, if any of those are present this afternoon, to honor Mr. Roosevelt Wilson. Two sons, I'm sorry. Can you give me this? Say it again. Roosevelt Wilson the third. My apologies. So please give the Wilson family a hand this afternoon. At this time, I welcome Councilwoman Hope Harper to come forward to introduce our next honorees. Good afternoon. I am here to recognize our honoree, and y'all know I'm all about that girl power. So, Evelyn D. Chandler was born in September 1931 in Newport News. 
She grew up attending schools in Hampton and Newport News and her family church home of St. Paul AME. She married in 1952 and traveled with her husband Lloyd, living in Portugal, New York, Michigan, and Hampton, eventually settling in Isle of Wight County. Chandler's professional career began with the Book of the Month Club and culminated in tendered service with the Chesapeake and Potomac Telephone Company, where she retired as a group chief operator in 1988. She was actively involved in community building and historic preservation, serving on the Virginia Historic Review Board as Vice President of the Virginia State Conference for the NAACP, the Chair of the Isle of Wight County Planning Commission, and President of the Women's Auxiliary of Lazone's Social and Civic Club. In Hampton, Chandler was a champion for Aberdeen Gardens spearheading the push for the neighborhood's historic designation. Ms. Chandler's son, Kenneth Chandler, is a deputy city manager in Virginia Beach. If he is here, or any members of Ms. Chandler's family is here, would you please stand so you can be recognized? Thank you so much, thank you. Councilman Martha Mug Councilwoman Martha Mugler, can you tell us about the father and son who are our next two honorees? Thank you, Hope. <clears throat> it is really an honor today to, to um, be able to recognize this father-son duo because I knew and know them both well. And uh, so I was glad I got the script in advance so that I didn't burst into tears when I had to chat about these two really fine gentlemen. Claude Van Jr. was born on June 9, 1932 in North Carolina. His family moved to Hampton while he was a child and became original members in the Aberdeen Gardens community where he grew up working as a paper boy and playing on the Aberdeen Rattlers softball team. And in 1949, Van began his 28 year career in the US Air Force. His job as an aircraft mechanic took him across the country and around the globe. He quickly rose to the rank of Chief Master Sergeant and, and spent off duty time playing on softball teams at various levels. And in 1971, Van was reassigned to Langley Air Force Base and became a senior airman advisor for the first fighter wing. He started growing his own businesses in trucking, landscaping, and real estate, which he expanded after retiring from the Air Force in 1977. Van advocated for the historic designation of Aberdeen Gardens and took an active role in community and civic affairs. He devoted his time and talents to to assist in the restoration of the Aberdeen Gardens Museum complex and served as a member of the executive board of the Historical Foundation of Aberdeen Gardens, which is where I met him. Uh, Van represented the Aberdeen Gardens when the community received designations in 2002 as Neighborhood of the Year and in 2007 as a multi-partner Neighborhood of the Year. He volunteered with the Convention and Visitor Bureau to become to welcome visitors to the city and share the history of Aberdeen. He was always eager to help his neighbors, to keep them informed and to re represent their interests in history. He was often called the unofficial mayor of Aberdeen. Claude Jr. famously more than once said, if I go to heaven and St. Peter does not have a place for me, I will request a return to Aberdeen Gardens because that is the next best thing to heaven. <laughs> Claude Van III was born in Savannah, Georgia and moved to Hampton as a student in 1971. After graduating from Bethel High School in 1973, Van attended Hampton Institute to study business as a, and as a distinguished military graduate in the ROTC program, he was commissioned in the U.S. Army as a second lieutenant in 1977. He returned to Hampton University as an Army major in 1989 to serve as an assistant professor of military science. 
mentoring cadets in the ROTC program and leading the Military Alumni Association, the Tidewater chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen, the Hampton Sharks swim team during a five-year tenure. Van retired from the Army as Lieutenant Colonel in 1998 and returned to Hampton where he worked with Hampton University, Newport News Shipbuilding, Norfolk State University, and the American Red Cross. Van has had an active role in the Aberdeen Gardens community, leading the Aberdeen Gardens Historic and Civic Association as president for its Neighborhood of the Year Award. He established an orientation program about the Aberdeen community for police academy cadets and worked with the convention center as, and visitor bureau to bring citizens to tour Aberdeen Museum complex. Van served as the co-chair of the city's 2019 commemorative commission and was heavily involved in the formation of the Hampton University Rocks chapter and has served as the president of the Hampton University Military Alumni Association since 1999. He has worked with the Tucker family and the Barrett Peak Foundation on the maintenance of historic African American cemeteries in, Ham in Hampton. Van is an active member of Harvest Church and the Aberdeen Gardens Neighborhood Watch. And he continues his involvement in the community rejuvenation efforts. He is the third Claude Van to live and to live in and lead in Aberdeen Gardens. In describing the passion for the neighborhood, Claude Van III traces it back. A lot of it has to do with the pride that has been instilled. I look back to my grandfather and how he so meticulously took care of his lawn and how he really respected the community. And I used to see my father patrolling the area like a soldier patrols the perimeter. That closeness remains and when Claude goes by the neighborhood today he sees people that he knew or whose husbands, fathers, cousins, and grandmothers he has known. How special is this place? There aren't many Aberdeens, he said. Claude III, will you please stand and be recognized? And if there are members of the Van family, would you also stand to be recognized? Mayor, Duck, Mayor Tuck, can you please introduce our last, but certainly not least, honoree. You sure? Okay. Our last honoree is Margaret Wilson. And actually prior to the beginning of the ceremonies, I did my best imitation of her uh, when we were in Denver for the All America Cities um, contest. So I won't do it here because this is a serious event. But Margaret Wilson was born and re raised in the Aberdeen Gardens neighborhood. As she will proudly tell everyone who listens, her family was the first to move into the neighborhood. She graduated from Phoenix High School in 1957 and continued her education at Cortez Peters College. She traveled extensively as a military wife and mother of two sons. While abroad, she worked with military families who were in need of medical treatment, food, and child care. When she returned to the United States, she was appointed Black Employment Manager for the Air Force Civilian Personnel at the Pentagon. She was later hired as a Special Emphasis Program Manager for the Air Force 11th Wing Headquarters where she was responsible for ensuring that minorities were treated equally and fairly for job opportunities and promotions. After returning to Hampton, Miss Margaret, as nearly everyone calls her, became active in the Aberdeen Gardens Historic and Civic Association. She served as chair of the Aberdeen Gardens Annual Heritage Day and later vice president and president of the Historical Foundation of the Aberdeen Gardens Board of Directors. She's been crucial in the effort to tell the unique story of this historic neighborhood, not just the facts of the neighborhood, but the character as well. She hosts tours of the museum. 
She was featured in the Washington Post story about Aberdeen Gardens in 2019. She has also traveled twice to Colorado to tell her story to the judges for the All-American City Award. While most people talk about, while most people talked about the opportunities and programs across the city, Ms. Margaret's goal was to make sure they understood the importance of Aberdeen Gardens, both historically and today. This lady is no wallflower. She proudly shared her age each time to emphasize that she was still active. She was so fond of the people who traveled with the delegation that she basically adopted one of the participants as her grandson. Ms. Margaret believes that police officers need to know the community they serve. She invites every new class of Hampton police recruits for a tour of the neighborhood, a trip to the museum, and lunch. When Aberdeen has its annual fish fry or fundraising gala, elected officials and top city staff are always in attendance. She no longer lives in Aberdeen. The family's homes went to other relatives, but you would never know that from talking to her. She will frequently remind me and all candidates for public office that there are many generations of families who are, who are or were Aberdeeners, and they all vote. Ms. Margaret also served for many years as chair of the Hampton Electoral Board and is a dedicated member of Ivy Memorial Church. Ms. Margaret, would you please stand and be recognized? Now, if I was going to be less than serious, I would say how at the All-America City Award, she said, I'm 83 years young, and I'm still engaged. <laughs> but I'm being serious. So in closing, uh, as we close this part of our ceremony, I want to urge everyone to follow your own path toward justice, equality, courage, faith, peace, and love. And I will leave you with one last quote from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be a sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or fall. Be the best of whatever you are. So please join me and us outside for the unveiling of the new Hampton Heroes names added to our plaza. And please allow us a few moments because we need to get our coats over here because it is cold outside. So thank you all for coming.